Hello everyone and welcome back. Now in the previous video we looked at some of the challenges that come with differentiating a Fourier series expansion. In this video we're going to look at the other side of that coin, that's integration. And we're going to see that things work very well for us. So let's start with the theorem. Let's talk about this sort of integration theorem for Fourier series. Okay, So a Fourier series, a Fourier series of a piecewise smooth, always piecewise smooth, function f of x um, can always, look at that, that's lovely, can always be integrated term by term. Um, and the result is a convergent infinite series that always converges always converges to the integral of f of x uh, for all x in, let's say, minus L to L. That is awesome, right? Because that tells me that if I just integrate term by term, I'm always going to get a conversion series. Now, there's something I left out of this, and if you want, you can pause and see where the nuance is. Um, but if you guessed it, it's that I just said it's an infinite series. I didn't say it's a Fourier series. That's the problem, right? So let's actually take a look at this. Here, I would get something, you know, if I have a piecewise smooth f of x, let's imagine I've got a nice Fourier expansion, okay? So it's piecewise smooth, we know that it can be uh, written as a Fourier expansion or a Fourier series. Oh, you're probably getting really sick of writing Fourier series if you're anything like me, um, but probably do it in your sleep by now. If you take the, the antiderivative here, so in my case, I'm gonna do the antiderivative as a definite integral from minus L up to F of X, uh, sorry, up to X. Uh, sorry, I need a different integration here. Uh, let's use, let's use, let's use T, that's okay, because we're not talking about PDs right now. Um, here's what we know. We know that this is equal to, no longer have a squiggle, it's perfectly equal because it's a conversion series everywhere. But take a look at this, A0 of X plus L, that's integrating that thing term by term, plus, and now integrating this thing term by term gives me a n over n pi over l. I'm just going to write it as a fraction for now because I don't want to have to uh, mess around with it too much. Sine of n pi x over l. That's just the antiderivative, the integral from minus l to x of that term right here. Plus... Uh, actually, let's write it on the next line because it's going to be a lot, plus the sum. And if I take the antiderivative of this term, you're going to see, okay, bn over n pi over l. And then let's take a look at this. I get cos of n pi, uh, n pi, sorry. This is the antiderivative at l here. And then minus cos of n pi x over l, and then let's put that all in a square. Okay, so it's ugly, right? First of all, there's a linear term in here now. That came from integrating the constant, so not a Fourier series anymore. It doesn't have uh, just sines and cosines in it. Plus, there's this weird little thing, right? This thing is just a constant series. There's no x involved in this term right here. So things get a little strange, right? They, they, even though you can do the integration, they don't give you a Fourier series back. 
This is different than what we saw with differentiation because differentiation goes Fourier series to Fourier series to Fourier series to Fourier series. Here, not so much. Let's take an example. Let's take the sine series of one, okay? So here, I'm gonna give it to you. It's four over pi and then times sine of n pi over L plus one third sine of uh, three pi x over L plus one fifth sine of n pi, oh, sorry, sorry, this should be five. So used to writing n, whenever I have to write an actual number, uh, I get confused. And this is for x in uh, zero to L. And you actually get a quality for any x between zero and L. Okay, not at the endpoints because it doesn't satisfy uh, uh, f of x equal to zero or f of l equal to zero. But again, this is this series is the odd extension, so technically it is a series over minus l to l. And if I integrate this thing, okay, so if I just do the integration that that we just saw here, I get x. And this will be equal to 4L over pi squared. Okay, so I'm going to pull that out. And then if I do all of the integration, the, the first constant term at uh, capital L, this is going to give me, or sorry, at x equal to zero, pardon me, is going to give me 1 plus 1 third squared plus 1 fifth squared plus blah, 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 blah. And then minus 4L over pi squared. And now I get this cosine series. I get cos of pi x over L plus 1 over 3 squared cos of 3x uh, pi over L. And so on and so forth. Okay, I'm going to let you have your fun with that. But this is for x in 0 to 1. I'm oh, sorry, 0 to L. So, so this theorem tells me that this is equal, right? So technically, I have a cosine series, so an odd, or, or sorry, an even extension of x, which is one that we sort of already computed. But we also have this infinite series that pops up inside of this thing, right? So one plus one over three squared plus one over five squared. Since this is a cosine series, right, there's no constant term that came up because I just had a sine. Well, what I could do is I could figure out what that is. So we must have, well, we know that the, co the constant term in a, in a cosine series is the average, right? So we must have the following. Let's see. We must have that 4L over pi squared, which is this term right here. And then 1 plus 1 over 3 squared plus 1 over 5 squared plus 1 over 7 squared all the way up. This has to be equal to the A0 coefficient of my cosine series, which is just equal to L over 2. So the L's are going to cancel here. And essentially, we can do some manipulation but you can see that this thing has to be equal to pi squared over eight. So if you take one over the square of all of the odd numbers and add them up, that's gonna be equal to pi squared over eight. Now this is a cute little trick, right? It allows me to, to find uh, the value of infinite series just using, uh, or infinite summations using Fourier series. And you could imagine, you know, this is what people could have done uh, back in the 1700s, whenever Fourier gave us these Fourier series, you can do all these kind of cute little manipulations to find uh, these infinite summations just using information like this, right? The fact that I know that um, these constant terms in my cosine expansion, that's just the average of my function. Integration here is super easy. And so determining the sum of this infinite series is now also easy. It's a cute little trick and it's a fun game to play. Um, but essentially what this tells me now is that x, once I sort of simplify this from an infinite summation here, um, 
this whole thing now is going to be L over 2, and I get equality, and then minus 4L uh, over pi squared, and now I've got all my cosine terms. Cos of pi x over L uh, plus 1 third squared cos of uh, 3 pi x over L plus 1 over 5 squared uh, cos of 5 pi x over L, blah, 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 right? Now, just at the intuitive level here for a second, okay? Think about why integration works and why differentiation doesn't work. Remember, when differentiation happens, you get a factor of n multiplying in front of this, right? So this is something I talked about in the previous video. And that can cause disturbances to your, your convergence of these things, right? Because mostly the convergence comes down to these coefficients, a n and b n. However, when you do the integration, you sort of, you make these things smaller, right? You divide them by n instead of multiplying them by n. So in some sense, if they were already convergent, you're just throwing in another uh, weight factor, another one over n that's gonna cause them to just converge faster. So there is a bit of an intuition behind why integration works so well and differentiation doesn't. And again, I, I mentioned uh, in the previous video that uh, when the differentiation doesn't work, we get what's called a weak form solution to the differential equation. Now the weak form of something is an integral form. Instead of posing a partial differential equation in terms of derivatives, we can equivalently pose it in terms of integrals, which I'm not gonna go into here for, uh, for now, but the reason the weak form works a lot of the time is because integrals are easier to handle. They have this nice sort of smoothing uh, property. They make things converge, whereas differentiation causes a lot of problems. So if you're having trouble getting solutions to a partial differential equation, often you have to look at the weak form and look at what are called weak solutions. And they come from integrating and they converge in the same way that we were just seeing here. Okay, let's do it again. Let's integrate this thing again. So this tells me that x squared over 2, again, just integrating uh, my function from 0 to x. Well, this thing, again, equality. Now, L over 2 times x. Nice little integration here. And here I get minus, I get 4L squared over pi cubed now, because I get an extra factor of L over pi. And I get some fun signs in here. Sine of... Um, what do I have? Pi x over L uh, plus 1 over 3 cubed sine 3 pi x over L plus 1 over 5 cubed sine of 5 pi x over L. So again, just getting another factor of n in here and really sort of sinking that thing down. The, the inverse of squares always converges, the inverse of cubes also always converges, and so you get these nice, uh, in, these nice sort of convergence properties. But here's the problem. What I had previously was a sine series. My sine series differentiated to a cosine series. Or sorry, integrated to a cosine series. My cosine series integrated to what is partially a sine series but now is not a sine series. The same problem we saw right here, right? It gives me a, a constant term. So this is the difference. Integrating Fourier series doesn't always give Fourier series. And you know, one answer for that is just that you get these constant terms that integrate up and give you an X. So we could, so you could, well, here's what you could do. You could obtain the Fourier series, series of, well, what would I get? X squared over two minus L over two X, right? So if I just pull that over, I would get the sine series of this function. Okay, that's kind of interesting. Maybe I could use something about that. Or I've already got the Fourier series of X, 
right here. So I could plug in Fourier series of X to get Fourier of um, x squared over 2. All right, so I could just take the information right here. I've got a cosine series expansion of x. I could put it in right there, and that would give me the, uh, the Fourier series expansion of x squared over 2, which would now involve both cosines and sines, okay? Now, this is two different ways of looking at this thing. Another way that you could do this with an alternative to what we just did up here is we could just perform indefinite integration. Okay, so I, I'm always doing sort of definite integration because it's it usually, you know, it sort of makes more sense. But uh, we could just do sort of antiderivatives and we could just say that x is equal to. Um, instead of having to deal with these infinite summations, we could just skip right to this step right here, right? So you could just say that if I integrated this thing term-wise, I would get, uh, you know, a constant. Remember, when you do indefinite integration, you get plus C on the end all the time. Remember, I used to lose a point whenever I took my calculus class every time I didn't put plus C on the end of something. So now it's drilled into me. And then you do the, the antiderivative of the other terms, Right, because you know that that constant's coming up. I'm only going to go up to the, the number three here just because I've written this so many times. Uh, you're probably getting bored of it. But in this case, then you, you know that this C is just equal to your, your sort of average because you have a cosine series, uh, 0 to L of x dx equal to L over 2, right? So that, that way we don't have to actually figure out what this thing is. You could, you know, look at L over 2, L over 2, right? So it's already in there. You could just do indefinite integration and then plug it in at the end so you can just completely avoid all of these, um, all of these pieces here. Now, um, you would do the same thing here and you would find that that constant term is actually equal to 0, your sort of average or your, your integration of your function gives you just this x term. But essentially what we've seen now is we've gone pretty deep into the theory of Fourier series. I don't want you to lose perspective of why we've done this though, right? Remember we spent all that time doing separation of variables which you were probably getting bored with because we did a lot, a lot, a lot of separation of variables. But every time we did it, we got sine or cosine series. Therefore, if we're going to get sine or cosine series, we have to understand what they mean. And that's what we've been doing for the past few lectures. We've seen differentiation properties. We've seen conversion properties. We've seen integration properties. Now we have the mathematical nomenclature to fully understand, you know, what we're actually doing here. Instead of just doing, you know, standard plug and chug and, and writing something that we don't fully understand, right? We are mathematicians here. We have to understand this at a mathematical level. In the next video, I'm going to come back with just a short lecture on the, the interface between Fourier series and complex numbers and the sort of more typical representation that you'll see for Fourier series in terms of uh, exponential functions instead of sines and cosines using Euler's identity. So I'll see you all in the next video, everybody.